So now from David Pinder's presentation, we have seen the topics utopia and rights to the city from an academic point of view. And now we're going to see the artist's view. And with us today, we have uh, Kennard Phillips, Peter Kennard and Kat Phillips, who will talk about this from, from their point of view, showing you uh, many examples of their art and some of the ideas behind it. And they will go on for about half an hour. And then Carla McCormick will join them in a Q&A session following up their uh, talk. So with this, give a big hand to uh, Kenneth Phillips. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So in the program, it said that Hayoro was also giving an artist presentation, but she needed to finish up her work, uh, her wall, so she was unable to, to squeeze in a presentation today. So that's why it's a slight bit of change in the program, where Hayoro is... Uh, uh, exchanged with another Stop person with, with long, long hair, hair, which of course is uh, Carlo. He had the longest hair we could find for someone who could <laughs> step in. So, uh, please. Do you want me to use this? Yeah, if you want to, we can have this. Hi. Um, oh, yeah, there. Um, yeah, we've, um, we've started collaborating um, at the time of the invasion of Iraq, before, just before the invasion of Iraq. And we wanted to make, we sort of, um, we're doing different things and we came together to start making work about the, the invasion and the, the horrors of the uh, aftermath um, uh, after the big demos that went on around the world uh, were against it. So, you know, we, we all went on the demos as probably a lot of you did. Um, and then the invasion happened and... Um, it was to try and keep a momentum going about thinking about what was going on over there. And um, images were coming back from there and they weren't really getting used in the press of, of all the um, horrors and the torture. So we wanted to actually start making work at, at, uh, about that. And then since then, we've gone on working together and the work's expanded into doing work around all different um, issues around... Um, uh, capitalism, neoliberalism, possibilities, critiques, and that's what we're going to show. So we're going to show quite a lot of slides. I think it's quite important that you interrupt us, because otherwise it's going to get very dull and sort of monotonous and lecture-led, which is like not probably as useful as it could be if it was a discussion, like, or, I don't know, some sort of interaction. But, um, yeah, so our, our starting point of collaborating, is, and our, all the starting point of our work is rage and objection about what's happening in the world, or about our situation, or about political policy. Um, so it's like what David was talking about, um, oh shit, now I'm going to try and be intellectual, but he, he was talking about uh, like the utopia being uh, an objection or like a critique to what's present, like rather than trying to visualize what's, rather than trying to visualize what a utopia or what an ideal way of living would be, you would criticise what it is at the moment to try and break open a gap, yeah? Mm. That's pretty much yeah. how we work. But, and in terms of uh, protests, it's like a platform, you know, like demonstrations and protests give us a platform to, to work on, you know, as much as a gallery gives us a platform, we use protests, well not use them, but we join protest movements as a platform to make work as artists. Um, so Occupy was something more recently in that, in that area where we made like, it's, this is montage, but it's montage in a real space, you know? So the idea was to, to make a montage of David Cameron, like, but have the people breaking through his face, you know? And his face is already filled with all the figures of the, all the, the profit from the stocks and share listings. We have to try and make it possible for them to break in. Well, no, no. Well, <laughs> you can break in. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So we took this out on demonstrations. Um, there were big demonstrations of, uh, against um, student cuts and against austerity in London. And we took this black out, which is made of paper and cardboard and very um, down-to-earth materials. Um, and the idea was, as you say, that... Uh, the, the, um, the people break through this image because often when you get big 
banners on marches, they actually obliterate the people on the march. Our idea was to open it up to show the people. Um, and then it, it went into uh, a newspaper, The Guardian, in London, and you can, see, you can see it there. Um, very strangely, in that photograph that someone took, the, the person actually behind it has got a suit and tie on, and it looks like it's a member of the Secret Service, <laughs> which is the only person like that on the whole march. So it's, it's got a dual sort of... Uh, I tell you, the best thing about that banner was when we got into the financial district in London, so it's called the City of London, um, it, you, you were like, there was this, there's this one, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like a massive junction crossroad, and it was just filled with people, you know, it was filled with all the demonstrators, um, and it wasn't even that big a demo, but just that sense of occupying that space in, in amongst those glass like and steel buildings. And up there were all the city workers in their suits and they had stopped work and they were like up against the windows and just the feeling of having like made that nano intervention. But, um, but they were looking down and you knew that they could see this banner of this face ripped apart because that was like, it was big enough to be a clear graphic, you know, to them. That just felt so nice because that was our <laughs> audience all of a sudden. And that's very different to having a, you know, like a controlled space to show in. And yet you could like witness it immediately, you know? Yeah. And, and it's in a sense a sort of utopian image when you see one a version like that, because the people behind it are actually, f you feel they've got a strength to them that they can break through it. And then there are, th recently um, there, was a there was a group called Flying Leaps who, who are putting work up, fly posting work around um, England um, and Scotland actually. Um, and they, they took one of, the, one of the, this is one of the images, we did a series of them on financial, um, the Financial Times and then with, a, with this rip through the head and it shows a, a corporate building. So it sort of speaks for itself. And it was actually put up on the week of Brexit in in um, in uh, England, yeah, so all up and down England and Scotland as well. Yeah, there was a group, a lot of people sort of fly posted it around different places. But so it's a work that that image is a work, it's a small work that was made as one of a series of thirty-nine that was meant for a gallery show because they're just newspapers, so they can't really sh they can't show in the street that, or they could, but only once and they'd be gone. Then it's been made into a bat. We made the take on it for a banner for a protest, and now, then this group was able to pick up this one of the series and run it as a fly poster across the country. Um, and they're like an art project that wants to reclaim space, you know, for art. And this was their their first one that they did. So it's like working across all those different platforms, just making use of whatever's there, whatever's available. Yeah. But montages are like starting points. It's always like using press photography to try and critique what's happening in the world and try and re reimagine as well what's happening or like bring in new ideas of the status quo, like from a different perspective, which you could show. So, so this one was, um, there was a series we were going to do for, uh, there's a, uh, John Pilger, he might know, he's a journalist, very revolutionary journalist, um, and uh, he, he did a thing about the media, a film about the media and about the, the, the way the media was actually completely in uh, tow with the military in relation to Iraq. So we did a series of roughs um, for him, which um, were going to be used in the film. And this is just so you can see that the way it's constructed when we get images, I mean, then we just put them together very roughly to start with, and then um, something like this is much more carefully put together. That's Bush and Blair going into number 10, and that's English squaddies uh, torturing someone. So it's bringing, it's the, it's the classic uh, dialectic of montage, you know, where you bring two things together and you create another meaning. Um, the meaning hopefully reveals what is usually totally separate in, in our society, you know, where, where you get an advert and then you get an image and then you get a, a, a leisure image and you get this. With, with montage, you bring that lot together and hopefully start revealing. So it's, it's, it's 
I suppose it was last night people talking about postmodernism. I mean, it's not postmodernist in the sense that postmodernism suggests that there isn't a construct you can give meaning with, I think, um, in, in visual art it's become like that. Whereas with our stuff, I suppose we still have that belief that you can actually show cause and effect. You can show um, what's, what's usually separate, which is these two bastards at the top, and then you can show that with it. You can just put them into the same space. And it's a, you know, it's a real fight and a battle to do that. And the battleground is the morass of images that we are living with and the morass of information, I suppose, which is beautiful as well. But so that our process of making montage is very much about looking through thousands of images and actually it's somewhere back or somewhere like, somewhere that I don't know where it is in, my, in our brains that, that, that they connect the image, you know? So it's that moment that's actually subconscious that picks it up, but you have to make the slog to go through all, all of that material and allow your brain as well to soften up to that point to, to do it. Mm. And we, we sometimes make montage of the, of the, great, uh, of the great people of our time, like Rupert Murdoch, that was the one we did for this, and this is the latest one, which is, hardly, <laughs> which is probably one of the most subtlest images we've made, <laughs> um, which we hope to Propagate. I think we'll wait for a moment when he's doing something interesting or horrible. Um, but it was shown at Glastonbury, wasn't it? Um, yeah, there was, there was an area of Glastonbury Festival. It's a big music festival. I don't know if some of you will know it. Um, and there's an area called Shangri-La, which is born out of the Travellers uh, movement. Is it a movement? I don't know. But anyway, the Traveller scene in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, they through a long evolution, they now have an area of Grassenby, which is called the Southeast Corner. One bit pocket of that is called Shangri-La, and they wanted to uh, envision, you know, like total corporate domination of us, of ourselves. So they had a lot, they commissioned a lot of different artists to dress the space. It was a very muddy year. You can see the ground was like this deep in mud. So it was like uh, quite an empty <laughs> space at the end of the day, you know. Um, and, and this image, you, we, we made all these cut-out figures, um, which are pictures of refugees climbing over walls to get into Europe, Europe um, and then blew them up and cut them out, and they appear on uh, all these uh, billboards that we did. So they're like, you suddenly get quite a free song because they're very, very real in that sense, even though they're, they're what are they called, flat daddy, you know, they're flat pack, they're completely flat, but they, they have a sort of... Uh, <coughs> intensity, their life size. And then on this one, we're using that idea of the, the, the reveal, I suppose, because the top picture, which has got a sky logo behind it, is being pulled up and it shows a, a woman refugee struggling through barbed wire, holding a child. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose a lot of what we do is trying to create impact, but also like some critical thought as well. Uh, so the putting the figures along the top of the fence did give like people a shock. And also there's a history in Glastonbury of you used to always climb into Glastonbury. I mean I've never paid to go to Glastonbury, you just climb over the fence and that's been made Im impossible now. So you have to find like ways to get in through the ticketing system. Because the fence that they've built is like so great and policed um, that it's impossible now. So it was a nice echo for the place as well. And this one, again, the face, the, it's actually torn, the, the top poster, so it's like, you know, it's ripped. The, the rip is very much part of a, a lot of the images we do. And, the, and that's a logo, that's a, a subsidiary of Sky, I think, isn't it? Yeah, Go in Germany. In Germany, yeah. Maybe just flip. And then you can see that's the good. figures here. And it's very much a nighttime scene, that place. So. The projections, they yeah. They did a very well yeah. lit. So, a lot of what we do is uh, recontextualizing press photography, because I think our, st I mean, really, our starting point of collaborating was a great rage about the propaganda in the UK around the invasion of Iraq. But pre to, prior to that, the sort of build up of propaganda pers to persuade the public that that was something, you know, that they would go with, uh, which they didn't, you know, there was massive protests, like million, two million in Britain 
protesting. But um, so this is like a, this is a, sometimes we make abstract work that's very big and can only exist in a museum or a gallery, a large gallery, which is what we made out of that image of a Red Cross ambulance, which was operating in southern Lebanon and it was targeted by the IDF, the Israeli Defense Army, um, and the Red Cross was just used as a target for, for a bomb from a plane. And, and this one, so th these ones are, f uh, what are they, six meters long, something like that? They're seven meters. Seven meters, and, and they're done on very, we wanted to make work that wasn't just, with mon you know, flat, we wanted to actually give a sort of physicality. There is that sense of wanting to use materials, so this is done on, uh, printed on very thin, paper that's then bashed with a hammer, so the, there's l lots of photographs you can't actually see from Iraq all around. And, and the, oh yeah, there's a the detail, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so you get these images, but they're all, there's, there's a whole lot of... Um, a battle of uh, And the point uh, of ripping up the surface is because we always see those press images in a very smooth context, you know, in magazine or newspaper. Um, so it was trying to make... Uh, that horrendous material, you know, come alive to a viewer. So these, they're, like Peter said, they're, they're big, but they're also, they're really fragile. They're like hanging off the wall, you know. So when we made them, we're smashing them up. They're just made out of newspaper. They're very fragile, but they're also very strong. And it's really interesting when you start, like, messing around with the human form on such a, I mean, it's quite, it's quite like the human like reality, we're very strong, but we're also extremely fragile, you know, and life can go like in a snuff. Uh, mm. So it echoes that sort of human. I suppose we're I, always trying to get to the human point in things that are presented us in a very structuralized, like closed system way. Yeah, and this was, uh, we did a, a exhibition and we, uh, in The Hague, we did some workshops. It's another as aspect of what we do is workshops with people so they can get to grips with material. But this one, we provided people with, the, with this picture of the, of the soldiers kicking the door in. And then the group of women who were doing this workshop, you can see one of them there, they decided to put it outside the space in the street and put an ironing board there and she, drinking a cup of tea. So it's an everyday scene that they constructed in relation to this image. And then this one was um, putting it up in a, on a billboard in London, um, where it's in fact flat, but it's, um, it's to do with an exhibition. Um, billboards, mm -hmm. we do that quite often. It seems to become like a thing, and there's the fantastic like printing technology. You can go really big with a montage, and it can be public in the streets or on the apartheid wall in Israel. Yeah, this was in, in Palestine, in Bethlehem. We went to Bethlehem and made, made work there on the wall. And this is Dismal Land, where, again, the actual um, pushing of this image, it's, it's, it's uh, um, Cameron again, drinking, drinking a glass of wine, looking incredibly supercilious and arrogant. And then this image of this boy in, in a hoodie is pushing the actual poster. So the actual poster is printed and then we back it to make it stronger and then it's actually pushed. So it comes off the wall, you know, quite a bit. So it's an actual physical presence. Yeah, and that's the impact of that work, the fact that you're shoving that billboard off, you know, and it creates the idea that you could shove off all that advertising that invades the space, certainly in the UK. I haven't seen much around Norway, but... Um, were like dominated by big billboard advertising in the UK. And um, there was a stage in front of it, so um, different groups played this. This is Sleaford Mods, yeah. 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 So they, a lot of the groups start refer to, you know, Cameron it's in like the image, the yeah. And that's Kate Tempest. And Run the Jewels, who are amazing. They did a whole yeah. set against them. And then this one was, um, uh, it was made for a magazine and then COP21 in Paris, a, a group called Brandalism, who you might know about, um, who, who got a lot of uh, artists' work and then um, printed them and put them into um, bus shelters and on... Like uh, you're doing here. Yeah. 
There, there are some here in bus shelters, I think. I no? Seen. You're not? Because I think there was a whole lot of posters. Yeah, you are? Yeah. So, yeah, so they put them all over Paris during the talks. And this one is, well, you can see it's, uh, it's an image of a rubbish dump where kids are actually scavenging for their lives um, as against people from the West walking along with their bags. So that went up on uh, a bus stop. And then that one's also, which is um, a petrol pump in amongst a whole lot of the rubble of war. Yeah, I know, but you describe it as well. <laughs> um, and this one was, this originally was a, a video, it's a video for Greenpeace. And um, uh, it was against dri oil drilling in the Arctic. And this is uh, the sort of lead image of it. And it's the um, Andrew Wyeth painting of, called Christina's World, which is one of the most famous paintings in America. So we just uh, covered the, the land with oil and put the, um, uh, oil refineries at the back, so it's um, and then left her as she was to give a you know to, to get through to people. I mean, one of the things about montage is you try and use a, a known image, so something that will get through. I mean, we're working in a tiny bit of the economic spectrum. We're being bombarded by all this horrendous advertising all the time. They've got the money. They've they've taken over the space. They've taken over almost every space possible in the cities now. Um, so we're working in a very small area, so the stuff we do has got to communicate very quickly. We've got to be able to get it across, you know, in a few seconds to, to grab people. Yeah, so you have to not be able to mistake it for advertising. Yeah. You want to describe this one? Um, yeah. So, yeah, sometimes we get commissions. That's another way of working, and we're very, very grateful to anyone, including New Art. Um, I forgot your name there. <laughs> um, um, you know, whenever, because that's, that's how we keep going. Like, it's getting, like, these little commissions. So this was, like, a small uh, activist group that uh, they managed to get a little budget together and they proposed to artists to come up with ideas that could happen in the street. Like, so it was to imagine a post-capitalist world. You had, to, you had to do it within the financial district in central London, um, which has got its own set of laws and it's got its own police force. So it's incredibly difficult to do anything on the street in that square mile, it's called. Um, um, and now, yeah, there's, there's areas like Canary Wharf and further out east in the Docklands that are similar, like they have their own private security and their own laws, so it's incredibly difficult to work publicly there. Um, and so this... I. I had a small baby in tow with me, so we had to come up with something that didn't have to move too fast. Um, and so we came up with this, which is we call the Cafe of Equivalence, which is just like, it's a graphic show, you know, um, but it had to somehow be able to be installed in that space that wasn't gonna give us permission or, or like, you can't just put stuff up in the street. So it shows, it's again printed on the stocks and share listings of the FT, the Financial Times, and it shows either, well, I mean, these are kids, but most of the other images are of the lowest paid workers in the world. So we were trying to start a debate and a discussion with, or like just trying to, I don't know, shove something in the face of um, very high paid workers who will work in that square mile. And we worked out that their average wage per day was something like 425 pounds a day. And uh, was it that? Something like I mean, that. We were, mm. that. we were suggesting that they buy soup from us for a quarter uh, of their daily yeah, wage. Yeah, 100 you know? and... It was like uh, yeah. equating the wage of the lowest paid workers with these suits. Uh, and uh, these were the visuals that went with it. So the bowl of soup was going to cost them 111 pounds, 16 pence. <laughs> But it was a way, you know, it was a way to get discussion going, basically. I mean, with the word, you know, it did engender quite a lot of discussion. And then a lot of our material gets picked up and used by other people, um, which we very much welcome, you know, and are freely open to. If it's like stuff that's trying, you know, it's not just publishing it in a mag glossy magazine. And so this is somewhere in Prague where they have like their old Soviet poster sites, and there's an art group called Art Wall that have set up a negotiation with the city to take over those sites to run art projects on them. That's mm. just that one. And, and that, so, yeah, yeah. installations. 
This one we no. get really furious about how boring and like two-dimensional our work is. Sorry. <laughs> so we start to like rip things up and burn things. Yeah, and we did it at the um, Edinburgh Festival year before last, and it was a quite a broken down space, and we put all these burnt boards that we'd actually done for another exhibition about Chilcot Report in Iraq, but we put them up and then put the newspapers, covered the floor in them. Um, the placard was there, um, and uh, people could came in, and it was, so, it was a performance area, but it was also operated as an installation when we weren't there. And we did this um, quite full-on uh, performance um, which was us scavenging around with a ca with a camera um, with a light on it, and that and the image came up on the screen of actually tearing away at these papers. So you get a, so you get an an image of the actual process, I suppose. So it, it's a further sort of demystification of the process, really, because we're showing how it's all put together, and. Um, it was a, like a performance, and we got a, a, a soundtrack. We did yeah, a soundtrack. Yeah, we made a soundtrack for the first time. That was quite mental, just going through the internet, finding sounds. But, it, um, yeah, well, I mean, we should have played it to, to prove it. But, um, it was there, uh, yeah. So that, that, that was another aspect of it. And, it, I mean, it's all about, in a sense, opening up the, the work, which is what we do in workshops, but also in something like this, for how it's made. So in the simplest way, it's encouraging people to create. Because um, I think one of the important things we've found is that when people can actually put material together, they start, it opens up their thinking. You know, they're so, especially young people in, you know, they're so taught that they have to do art and then they stop doing art and that creativity goes. That, that just having a room with piles of paper, magazines, newspapers, a printer, um, all this stuff together can actually create this fantastic atmosphere for people to, to create in. And that's, and that a that's that little model drawing for larger work that we put into a show that allowed us to create a space for people to make work in exactly the way Peter just described. Um, and then, but have it right in the center of Edinburgh Festival, which is a huge art festival in Edinburgh, in Edinburgh obviously. Um, it's got like, I mean, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's massive. And so the problem with the festival in Edinburgh is that it comes in August and it goes again. And it's incredibly expensive. It's predominantly like theatre shows, which are amazing. And the, true enough, the, they've started or restarted a free festival within the festival. So a lot of performers find that it's better just to do their stuff and like have a hat pass around at the end um, to, for whatever anyone, if won't, anyone wants to pay for it. But... The issue with it is for locals, it's like the festival comes, they can't go to it because it's too fucking expensive. You know, they feel alienated from it because it's like, it's got some really flashy stuff in it, you know, and some really big stuff. And it's like, uh, and also there's been a lot of clearing and gentrification, well, not gentrification, but it's a bit like Virgin have taken mm. over the whole center zone that used to be open to the buskers. Um, when I was a kid, that's where, like, that was where I could hang out because I didn't have any money, but I could still see stuff in the festival there. Now, Virgin have taken it over, and it's like, it's stalls, you know? Again, you have to buy stuff there. Um, so we wanted to make a show where people could, lo like, locally people could get involved, and they could actually show their presence, and it would exist after. So it carried on this show for, like, two months after the festival as well. Um, so this is a space... In, it's like an established photographic gallery, which we hung some of our larger works in, and then we built these structures out of pallets that we dragged off the streets like, around our studio and put them up there. But, I mean, you find pallets everywhere. And then we set up in a local shopping centre, like 10 minutes away, we set up a studio, um, which we call the War on War Room, and uh, just filled it with loads of material. Again, some, dressed it with some of our work, put in all of our equipment that we would make work with, and invited people, like local groups, to come and make work about whatever they wanted. I mean, most of our stuff is about capitalism and atmosphere. Mm, it was amazing. Because it was a big shopping center, and quite a, um, so people didn't expect to see something that they could come in and do. You know, you go to a shopping center to consume. 
And, uh, yeah. and we got some people who came back and back and back, you know, very much people that hadn't made any art before for, for years or if at all. And, uh, and then some of the cleaners got really off on the fact, because they're all like on a five minute schedule, you know, they're like not allowed to, so it's like, because can, we can't really step into the shop for more than like two minutes. So like some, you know, there's always supervisors like yeah. going around observing them. And uh, so they would come like after work or early before work to use the space. That woman Alex in amazing pictures, yeah. Yeah. And, and then there's an amazing gallery in Scotland called the Travelling Gallery, which is basically a bus, and it takes contemporary art all around Scotland to areas that don't have, you know, that are way out of, of reach of, of, of it. They don't have any galleries. Um, and they brilliantly, like, picked up on that show and said uh, we want to tour it so it start so we had to like reconfigure the show to fit inside a bus which is fair enough a bespoke gallery inside but it's still tiny um, so I, but we don't have an image of the well, anyway we, we, we clad one with one wall with a uh, with shove the work from Dismaland and then we clad the other wall with the pallets and some gates that would swing open so we could accommodate a lot of work and then we had to like set up those workshops like on the hoof in little like tiny little community centers or large community centers or like one stop shops for benefits and stuff like that. Um, and we were really aiming to go to the, the like, we couldn't do, we were aiming to go to the most deprived areas of Scotland. And then sometimes we've been asked to do it in museums and you get to do a big show of it, you know, and you can like, you can make a, a big, like, public presence in a location, you know, that's, that's seen as a very formal and, like, protected space. And I guess our aim is to make it as anarchic and as fluid and creative as possible. And also we provided, like, at this point, you know, we provided material, well, not much material, but, I mean, sticks, so people could actually put their work on placards. And, in, in fact, a lot of the kids' work became part of the exhibition there um, in this place in, in, place in Coventry. Yeah, and I think a, a large part of getting people to make work is actually just making them feel comfortable. And the only way you can do that is by, like, you have to, like, destroy this idea of the hero artist, which is we, we achieve quite easily, I think. I mean, we do quite a good job of that. Um, um, and then and you find that, like, as soon as you, like... And we also use materials that are very obvious, like newspapers, bits of wood, bits of cement, bits of mud that we find... You know, so it's uh, it's quite intuitive. People can see like how something's made, and then they can just feel like well that they can do it too, and then they mm. just do. Mm. And it's one of the great things about the new technology is that you know digital printers can exist in the same space as the people making the work. Which because when I was younger, obviously we had dark room, you had to move around. Here you can have, you know, it's that. Uh, Benjamin thing, author as producer, you're actually producing, you're, you're making and you're producing and it's all in the same space. And uh, mm. yeah, go on. No, I was just going to say that was the first war and war and we did it, which was in 2005. And to dress the space we came up with a set of posters and that was like one of the series of stop posters was this work that's now become like really pop, like really is travelled on its own, you know. Um, and it's got so that was where it was made, and the first place we took it, other than that space, was up to the G8 demonstrations, in, which were again in Scotland by chance. Um, and we used, we handed them all, all out, like on free, like we were printing out on free newsprint, and so we handed out all of those, uh, those it. demos. And then that's, um, it was the next year, wasn't it? That was Banksy did this thing called. Uh, who? Yeah, never heard of him. But um, we did this, he does this thing called Santa's Ghetto, um, which, in fact, the one with Palestine, that was his as well. We did w w with work. But he put it in the window of this one in Oxford Street in London. So it's next to a shoe shop, and it was Christmas time, so thousands of people went by. And um, that's when it was sort of, it sort of took on uh, a meaning. And a lot of people photographed themselves in front of it. A lot of kids had very complicated arrangements of photographing someone in front of it, photographing themselves in front of it, I don't know. You say that's right. yeah. it took on its meaning. No, no, it took on its, its uh, currency. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's the point. The thing is, like, if, that had not, if he hadn't picked that up and put it in his show, 
that that work wouldn't be known like and be, have been used, you know, it wouldn't have got out there. So distribution is like extraordinary, which is why the internet is so amazing, I guess, for street art because it distributes um, quite uh, fast, doesn't it? Mm. Um, so this is just like a lot of stuff that shows just how show, it's been yeah. used in different contexts. So like uh, animator who picked it up to use it as a as a protest at the Chilcot inquiry, which was putting Blair, you know, into under question. So that was projected, and and then this is the British Medical Journal, and they used it as a uh, to talk about cuts in the NA National Health Service in in Britain. So it's, you know, it's become it's sort of moved into other areas in terms of critique. Um, and that, they asked um, advertising directors what was their favourite advert of, uh, I can't remember what year, for a magazine called Campaign, and one of them chose Photo Op. And, you know, uh, quite often our work gets used by people in institutions or established, uh, like, industry or whatever as a protest of their own, you know. So our work's available for them to stick into their museum or whatever as a protest maybe to their, you know, curatorial, like, censorships, you know, that are imposed on them. And the, w the work has been censored as well. It, it was going to be used um, as an advert in Manchester for an exhibition by the Imperial War Museum, and then um, the people that own the advertising, this, this was like bus advertising, JC, Deco, and C CBS. Yeah. They said it was... Um, they said it was too violent or something, and they made an excuse they wouldn't use it. So it's been, um, and that's um, a website for this thing of arresting Blair. Um, that was at an exhibition at Tate Britain. We did it, uh, did it as a light box. And then, it's, the, uh, it's going, um, and this is from a newspaper. So it's just to show that, you know, you can't, that was a, that was a cartoonist version of it. In the um, Times, very right wing paper. Yeah. Like, so that's it being, it's like, it's bad use, you know, like, but it's the only time it has. This was like a, this is a, a serious magazine, journalist, journalist magazine in Turkey, where they copied the, the idea, but put Erdogan in there, and he's uh, photographing himself in front of a dead, it was, that, it was to criticize his comments at a Turkish soldier's funeral. Um, and as a result of that front cover, um, the, they got raided, their editor and several of their staff got arrested, and the magazine was collected from, it had already been distributed, the distribution had already started going out across to newsstands. Everything was like confiscated, confiscated off the newsstands. Um, so for me it's like a really poignant highlight of how free we are to like make these critical images and how it doesn't, uh, operate in the same way in different parts of the world. Mm. And I think it's something I was thinking about last night, I think, you know, in Egypt and after the revolution there, and still people are using street art. I mean, they're artists who can't work in any other way. A lot of them, there's a lot of young kids and kids out of art school who are using it as a way to report on what's happening and obviously risking their lives doing it. And they are literally mm. risking their lives, which yeah. is something, so, you know, we, we should be matching up to with our efforts, like invading public space here. Um, we should be, because they're doing it for us as much as they're doing it for themselves, you know. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's our bit. Thank you very much. Then you can sit down in our beautiful lounge here. Beautiful, yeah. Uh, then I want to welcome Carla McCormick, writer, curator, uh, critic, and uh, senior editor of Paper Magazine, which will lead us through this uh, Q&A uh, session. So um, if each of you will grab a microphone. So here is one for you. Yeah, that was brilliant. Thanks, guys. So good. Look at all that stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now I'm really pissed. <laughs> uh, you know, I thought to, just to kind of bring it into a little bit what David was saying before, we could start again with Utopia. It will be our recurrent thing. But uh, uh, 
and maybe the, the way that idealism is invested in critique. Uh, and and I, I just lugged this quote from Tom Moore from the book. For if you suffer your people to be ill-educated and their manners to be corrupted from their infancy and then punish them for those crimes to which their first education disposed them, what else can we conclude from this but that you first make thieves, then punish them? And it strikes me that's not exactly what most people think of when they think of utopia, is how genuinely pissed off Moore was at that time. And he was fighting something which is actually a little relevant to, uh, to the politics of street art. It was uh, enclosure, which was uh, basically the taking of public lands that whole people use for different ways for the kind of the sheep farmers, I think, so they could graze their cattle. And it was a kind of trespass laws come from it. About 100 years after mm -hmm. Thomas More wrote the book, we actually had the enclosure riots, which did change the nature of public space in England forever. But long way of asking uh, about the, this form of engagement and about where does the, the kind of righteous rage lead to a kind of positive idealism for you too? Does that make mm -hmm. any sense? Yeah. Yeah, it made a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that's, uh, for me, what, what you're saying is that it's the empowerment of people and giving people a space that they can, they can act in. I mean, that's very much at the heart of, and that might just be within their thinking, you know, in their heads, in their imagination, but that's definitely like the aim or the ambition of our work, I think. Yeah. And then those workshops and stuff, they extend that into actual space and actual action, you know, it's like how, how to actually create action out of work. Yeah. Mm. And um, I mean, I, I think this utopia, I mean, when utopia is um, designed, it's usually horrific. I mean, sometimes a few shows, you know, one might think so the worst example, the most horrific is the Third Reich, you know, what, what they, they were going to do with Albert Speer. Um, so uh, I, th I think utopia, you know, I really believe that utopian vision now is to do with show, is, is bringing people in to, um, to work together and to make something that can, can communicate a critique. It doesn't have to communicate just, you know, a utopian vision. A utopian vision comes through critique. Um, so yeah, I suppose and that, breaking what, it, what is there at the moment, which... You know. Kind of social anarchism. Yeah. Yeah, you could if you aren't a label. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, I think it's a different time. I can remember in the 60s, you know, we used to sit around and get stoned and listen and think we were being very revolutionary. Um, but we didn't construct anything for people. And like um, Occupy, which was a couple of years ago, in you know, the London one, which, you know, they constructed a library, a free library. They constructed very complex toilets and things that work chemi you know, um, organically and all this, it's much more, that is, to me is utopian because you're showing, you're demonstrating something. I mean, in a sense, this building and what's going on here, that's, that's, that's yeah. within yeah. the space, of the everyday space, you're creating something. I, I think we inherited more from, I think they set up more structures than we realized in the 60s. I mean, let's not entirely cut it short, but it, yeah. it is, because uh, you're kind of informed by anti-war movement, Vietnam, right? Yeah. And then you kind of migrate yeah. into no nukes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I went through, I mean, when I started off, there was a whole um, uh, a lot of outlets on the left as well, a lot of newspapers, and there were... Which is one of the legacies of the 60s was the underground yeah, press. Yeah, the underground press, and, um, and there were left groups. So there was a lot of outlets now, which um, there aren't in the same way. I mean, in, and in London, people could set something up, could squat a space and do something. But you can't, you can't do that now. So that tends to happen on the internet, I think, yeah. in a different way. But you two are sounding really educated. And I really liked what you said at the beginning about uh, the uneducated and being left uneducated or something. Yeah. And then, so what was it? You create the... It was a little condescending what he's saying also. You know, 
Do you find it because it really spoke to me? Because I mean, that's yeah. what I totally believe in: is that we've got an innate, an innate intelligence that we're constantly being told we can't access. You know, so we're constantly being told there's experts, and if you're not an expert, you can't. You know, or you ought to, you ought to listen to the expert before you think about doing anything yourself. And I just don't agree with that. Yeah, and also all the corrective procedures. So instead of making things better for people, we produce situations of, of squalor and need and, and wonder why people behave a certain way. Mm. Hasn't yeah. changed so much. Mm. Okay. Oh, did you want to ask something? Yeah. No, no, it's just made me think the w workshop. I mean, when we did in Coventry, we had kids in who were, uh, what are they called? Refused from school? Uh, uh, they're excluded, yeah. Excluded kids who, who, who hadn't been able to go, you know, they were turned away from school. And they came in looking very bored to this thing with their, with their worker. And, and no, they, the can't, they didn't look bored, but their workers said, oh, you're not going to get anything out of them, you know, oh, like right. they're really, really oh, impossible. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and then um, by the afternoon, they were producing amazing work about their lives. They yeah, were, and they were doing it alongside, you know, regular students from the art college and like some drop-in pensioners who had just wandered in. And that like atmosphere of that cross section because these kids are apparently supposed to be excluded because they cannot be part of like a space that's being used in a you know they're considered as uncivilized or whatever they're completely fine you know so long as what they're being offered is something that they can do themselves and it can come from themselves you know and it's valuable what they produce they produce like serious work that was presenting their perspective of what was happening to them I bet it was amazing. Yeah, it uh, was. It, yeah, because this is really interesting part of your work, and I think it relates a lot to all the other kinds of artists who've come through new art over the years. Uh, in the art world, we now call it social practice because we love to come up with ridiculous or names relational. like that. Or relational aesthetics, yes, yeah. all those things. <laughs> but um, uh, working uh, with communities, with at-risk kids, with things like that, but it's, it's all the... It goes to the nature of audience as well, because you're talking about festivals and protests and, and different situations like that as the venue, as the medium, as the kind of uh, way of injecting your work into the culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, last night uh, we had an artist who was very passionate, uh, Robert, mm. about... Uh, Got to respect the passion. Oh, totally. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was that mad. Uh, that really but you still are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just heavily sedated. Uh, <laughs> that all, the whole point would be to get it into a museum. That, that was, and, and I'm thinking, like, mm. well, you've actually got a piece in the Tate. Mm. Yeah. And, and what, what's your audience? Which is more subversive, to get that piece into the Tate or to do these? No, you know, what, what is the audience? They both are. You know, so long as the work's, like, holding its own... Once it hits the museum, you know, I mean, it's just as subversive to have photo op in, in that Tate show, you know, that was very, like, supposed to be all about comedy. It was just subversive to have it there as to do something with Occupy, you know, or with the students in the student process. So it's not either or for you. That's wonderful. That's good. No. 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 no, because, I mean, how can it be? I mean, then you'd be, like, saying, well, I'm never going to go there. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. that's just like you're talking about borders again. Yeah, just a, a dumb political question, just because it kind of haunts me. I mean, when I see uh, you taking the piss out of Tony Blair, uh, it, it's almost, it, it can almost be nostalgic, because well, post-Brexit, he's such a <laughs> more benign <laughs> more benign ruler than, than, than some of the other options. You mean he's such a cunt? <laughs> he, he is, he absolutely is. But, I mean, in America now, we're facing... Uh, this, this, no, no, no. This Tony Blair is out there and he's fucking over Mongolia. He's fucking over the... He's creating, like, yeah. new contracts for Canadian mining companies all around the outskirts of Ulaanbaatar. He's, he's, con he's doing a lot of fucking damage. Yeah, yeah. So to call him a benign leader right now is, like, he's still leading in, in a lot of veins, you know? Mm. But, I mean, he's made that... that crossover into the corporate world from governance and from a really high position of governance because he was in power for a fucking long time, you know, and a lot changed in that time very fast. Um, he's still a cunt. Yeah. And he's still as bad as Donald Trump. 
Well, th this is this. But is he might I have been, he might have given birth to Donald well, Trump. This, this is, this, <laughs> but this is no, kind seriously, of, because Donald mm. Trump is coming from the other direction. He's coming from the corporate world, and he's entering American politics in a really popular way. You know, and people are like. Yay, go, you know. I think you're dealing with some really ugly politics of fear in London now. And to me, it's sort of like the, the kind of, uh, I meant benign as like the smiling face of fascism, needless to say. But in America, we're giving this moment right now with Trump and Clinton of like, either it's a false equivalency or it's like this kind of binary decision. And a lot of people are going, she's just as evil. And I'm like, she's no, not. she's not. No, she's not. But I mean, that's the same issue we had in the UK with Labour and Conservative, and people were so disillusioned with Labour right. after the new Labour thing with Tony Blair and, and the rest of them, um, that, you know, that people were like, well, fuck it, I don't give a fuck who's in power, you know, because they're all as shit as each other. So we had the same thing there, and now what's happened in the UK is like some massive change, you know, is happening right now. But we're like, we've got to a point where right now we've got a one-party state. We're not that different from China at this moment, yeah. you know? Culturally, yes, we've got a completely different cultural background, but the actual setup at the moment, you know, the actual structural setup, we've got one party, and because the left is not in a state where it's actually behaving as a party. Yeah. But doesn't mean that what's around the corner isn't like much more progressive, you know? I mean, People can look back and they can like try to like pull things back from the past, which are the conservatives have a lot of their ideals are just like, you know, their established ideals. I, you know, I think, you know, but the what's same happening on yeah. the street and with the left now is like a complete flux. So it might be shit and in disarray, you know, in terms of the established structure, but it's still there and it's pumping its, its heart to the guts. And people are more politically engaged right now in England than they have been in because the, the left has collapsed, you know, like, everyone's engaged in it. Well, it hasn't actually collapsed the left, it's actually taken over the Labour Party for the first time. No, but it's collapsed, in, it's collapsed in terms yeah. of parliamentary structure, you know. It's not operating in a formal way as a party, as a party which I think yeah. is really exciting. No, it's totally mm. split in two, yeah. I mean, can we, can we also, like, in the same way, Thank Maggie Thatcher and Ronald Reagan for giving us punk rock. You know, I, I, I think, you know, because you... Uh, no. You, you, yeah. <laughs> you don't think so? No. Uh, I, I, felt, I felt their their evil was the best provocation culturally, and a lot of great stuff came out of it. Their evil was well, a provocation. Uh, yeah. But are you saying this great stuff wouldn't have come out if we hadn't had like better leadership, like more like Jeremy Corbyn or something, or something more radical than? Well, I mean, I, I think th that's bullshit. I think there's always going to be stuff you're, to rail against. You're working against. in photo montage, which has you know a, a real history in terms of political art. Mm -hmm. John Hartfield, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, primarily amongst that. Um, but then you do have this resurgence with a bu basically a bunch of hippies. If you look at the visual artists associated with punk, Jamie Reed. Uh, in, your, in London, and G. Vosher in London, and in America we had like Arturo Vega was doing the Ramones and Winston Smith, and th these are all these are all montage artists. Mm. So I, I just, mm. you mean the situation creates montage? No, I think all situations create montage in the sense that they're all about breaks and splits and you know tears and rips. Mm. You know, because we're not you're not after an evil sort of equality of surface, you're after actually opening something up. So, um, I mean, obviously, uh, Thatcher did create an enormous amount of culture against her. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and there was, but I mean, that's happening now, you know, um, with just the, the everyday society, whether it's Clinton or Trump or, you know, Great right. street art for Trump these days. It's been really yeah, there has been some great... But it's Trump also stuff. corporations, yeah. isn't it? I mean, it's not just politicians. It's like business. It's big business. Yeah. And it's like... it's. Yeah. Uh, there's always going to be that to fight against. And there's always going to be something to fight against. I mean, it's like what David was saying in his... Uh, you know, the, the idea of utopia is actually like... It's, it's a struggle within the present, isn't it? I mean, that's actually what utopia is, is the action... Yeah. of struggle. And I mean, that's never going to go away. I mean, there's no, there's never going to be, I mean, we're organic, you know, we're organic 
creatures, we're like animals, you know, so it's not like, I mean, yeah, if we pass over into robotics, yeah, okay, then, but then we wouldn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, but there is something about, uh, about photo montage, it seems to me that because it's working off of juxtapositions, it seems to mm -hmm. be a language particularly well suited to the hypocrisies and the inequities and the, the chasms of difference that exist in our world, right? Yeah, uh, that's yeah. kind of yeah, the trope of, of, of your... Describing it. Yeah. 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 yeah, but then yeah. that's why, probably why we've like, got really frustrated with photomontage at times as well and have had to break out into making more sculptural structures or something that's like less, less like pinned down or definable, you know, yeah. to create space for other people to imagine into with us or for us to imagine with them you know yeah, I, yeah it's the yeah. physicality to it i mean that's what's important about you know stuff in the street it's physically there because so much is just on the on the internet and obviously so many people now are making montage with photoshop all the time and it goes around on twitter and whatever that um but it, it, it does seem important to have that physical interaction because otherwise we're all imagery it's going to be on is the surface is going to be the same and the thing about art is it's a physical it's a physical presence and is also there's only so many montages that you can make that are good yeah <laughs> but is it but even then <laughs> you, is know, it, is you it, make a lot of shit so then yeah. you go on to something else and you know but is it too easy now i mean when you think of it coming of this real handmade cut and paste kind of thing and now it's a uh, this digital thing that it, anybody can do on their computer is it no, but it's is great it lost, that anyone it can do it. Is it lost its craft? No, you? no, no. It's great that anyone can do it. But I mean, the craft of it is is actually taking time. You know, that's. Uh, that, I mean, at the end of the day, the craft is in yeah. the labor. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and the the commitment to like keep going until you actually get to a point that is worth actually printing. You know, or worth putting up on a post on in the internet. Oh, good. Well, I want to leave some time for questions. I'm a greedy bastard, so I'll ask one last one kind of thing because. Uh, it is interesting when you talk about this objecthood uh, of, you know, wanting, you know, the, the problem with this flat surface that you're constantly dealing with and, and, and how you're, you're addressing it. And, and I, and I kind of think about the surface of, of uh, resistance and the architecture of it. So this guy, Elias Kennedy, won the Nobel Prize a long time ago for this book called Crowds and Power, where he just studied the nature of crowds and power. And, and he talked about the power of the mob as always being the breaking down of the barrier that like the trigger point for a ride is often just simply that brick hurled through that window or that police barricade broached. It has to grow and it has to break things down. Mm. Um, conversely, like uh, 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 David in invoked uh, the, 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 the commune, I think that that and we think of, and even with the, the 68 student revolts, we think of the barricades which is the no, block. No, I immediately things. thought that would be beautiful in a big, like, posh gallery, wouldn't it? Just like a big, shitty barricade. Yeah, 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 it's good. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me leave it oh, open. You right. Unless there. you want to respond to that. But. Well, I like the idea of being part of the mob. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Was it a new art 
video, was it, yeah. from the city from the, of Bangor? From, uh, from uh, this year, ah. which you see, and the rhetoric in it. You know, it's like a new industry. I mean, in the same sense that art itself, contemporary art practice, has become like this huge market. So it is tied in with all those, those things that we fight against. But that collaboration uh, with those forces of capitalism that are to do with tourism or bringing people or bringing a city's profile up or is also inherent with um, that, that, local, that local society as well and a need to survive. You know, so it is like on one level a, a council's search to find ways for a town to survive, you know, in a competitive, like, big, busting world. And it's been really picked up. But um, I'm not sure that art's the worst way to, to, to try and survive. But I mean, the other thing is, as a, a, a create, you know, like, it's a very creative thing, you, or as an artist, you can't, you can't be pure. You know, we're, we're, we've got to deal with the shit. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise we go off to a desert island, or we drop out, we used to call it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah which, is, which is, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but um, if you actually want to get critique into the world and change things, then you have to deal with the powers that be. You, you, you know, one can't But I would stain, like to see more stainless. shit art, you know, like more, more of the shit in the art, not shit art, but like more of the shit in the, represented in the art. Come to New York if you want to see more shit As opposed to like very decorative, attractive stuff all the time. Yeah. Because I mean that 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 I, I mean you can see it with what we make. It's not like it's not very attractive, <laughs> most of it. He gets sorry so nervous. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'm done with all the time. Um, really sorry to interrupt this very nice conversation. You shouldn't then. <laughs> yeah. uh, so give me.